Well, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, hobbling around a little bit. I apologize for that. I stepped in a hole at work this morning, and I've been uh, hobbling ever since. There's that uh, old joke, I'm sure you all have heard of it, that uh, old age aren't, isn't for wimps. And uh, the older I'm getting, the more I'm... Uh, realize how much truth was in that joke it used to be funny when I was younger but um, it's not so much no so funny now um, and that lines right up with what I was going to open up with this evening it, it you know Lord's Providence I ain't saying you know, I got hurt on purpose this morning but it sure ties in because as I was getting this ready I was thinking about you know the older I get the more I appreciate the little things I remember when I was growing up um, I don't know about y'all and I'm sure y'all are probably about the same as I was every Sunday we went to grandma's and had dinner and that was a time for us to uh, play with our cousins and run around the yard you know things like uh, climbing grandpa's pine trees that he'd holler at all of us to get out of them pine trees over and over again I remember playing roly bat <laughs> I don't think kids today know what roly bat is we play roly bat and of course, there was a war always going on against some imaginary Indian. It would be either cowboys and Indians, or it would be some invading army. And then uh, y'all remember Charlton Heston showed us about the ape invasion, so we got to fighting apes, too. Um, but at some point while we were out there playing, Grandma or somebody would open the back door, and they would always holler out that dinner was ready, and then everybody would drop whatever they had in their hands if you had a ball bat you'd drop it or a gun or whatever you had and everybody would run for the back door and my grandma and grandpa had five kids which today that's a lot but I don't think it was back then and they had ten grandkids so when somebody hollered out dinner's ready you'd have ten kids rushing for the back door they'd be you know adults already in the house so with in-laws, you have 20, 21, 22 people in Grandma's house every Sunday. And I got to thinking about that because we, we would, you know, line up and we'd get our plates ready and then the adults would sit at the kitchen table or the bar that was in the kitchen. There'd be kids everywhere. So the, the entire house became a dinner table. And, you know, this, this was a time before, and them, them kids back there don't know this, but this was a time before cell phones and social media and all of that. So you wouldn't have the constant looking down at the phone. You wouldn't have the constant preoccupation. You'd be centered in on the person that was there with you. And everybody would be talking amongst themselves. And usually the conversations were good. There'd be a lot of laughing, a lot of family gossip and you know, some drama. Four, of, or four out of the five kids were girls, so there was constantly a sister mad at a sister, but, you know, it went all right. Um, and I got me to thinking, you know, because even now, when me and Eleanor is at home together, if she's not working, we'll sit at the kitchen table and have dinner and talk to each other. And then if, if Travis comes over with his wife and the kids, then we'll, we'll all sit at the kitchen table and have dinner together. And, and, and that's important. And I know I don't have to tell you all this, but as you read the four Gospels detailing Jesus' life here on, on earth, take note of the many things that took place, especially what he taught as, as they stopped, him and the disciples stopped, or, or even, even more than the, the 12 that we think of, this greater group that they stopped. And they'd sit down together and, and over a meal or whatever it might be that Jesus would take that opportunity when everything stopped to begin teaching or, 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 or to say something to the disciples, those around. Um, we remember the feast that Matthew had in his own house to honor Jesus. Where, where there he invited the other tax collectors and, and what you would consider people that, that society viewed as low life. And you remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the scribes, they interrupted the meal because this, this just, just tore up their nerves. 
because sitting down with someone at the table in that culture showed a bond. Jesus was identifying with these people. He was sitting with these people. He wasn't, he wasn't casting them off. He wasn't ignoring them. We're all familiar with the feeding of the 5,000 where Jesus turned an entire grassy field into a dinner table in order to test the disciples. And he, he showed them and he showed us that he's Lord over our physical world. That, that feeding everyone with a couple small fish and a few loaves of bread, that, that the material world didn't hinder him. And, and as, as I was coming home today, um, the Holy Spirit really really pulled one on me because he's like, you know, that, that really ties in with um, this, this food drive we got going on. Because, you know, he, he fed the whole nation of Israel coming out of Egypt. It, it wasn't Moses. It wasn't any, any man. God fed them with manna. He, he took care of them. The entire nation. And then you have, you have these 5,000 men and then their family with them. And, and the disciples were ready to send them home, tell them to go away. Evening was coming. We have no food. Let's send them away. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, you feed them. And I got to thinking about that as I was on my way home today. Like I said, he really threw me for a loop with this because he's like, you know, you feed them. And, and, and we was talking about this Saturday after the work day. God, God could handle all of that. I mean, he, he could feed every resident of, of, of the children's home. From, from the mountains of, of Clyde at the Broyhill home all the way down to Guatemala at the orphanage down there. He, he could feed them. He could supply their every need. But yet, he, he calls us to do this. And, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and I'm meditating on this, and I'm trying to, to, to just connect with God. You know, y'all all about that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And it's like, man, he, he could do that, but, but he includes me. He lets me take on that, that blessing because you, you get that knowledge that in, in a few months or, or somewhere down the road that, that what you brought that there'll be some, some three year old eating a pop tart that, we, that somebody brought or, or having a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich out of a, a jar of peanut butter and a jar of jelly that, that you brought and and to your that three year old who who wouldn't go, you know, somewhere like hours between meals, but might be going days between meals. And then Chris brought it up that first week we talked about doing this. When when you give that child that food, then you can not only tell them that there's people out there that love them. But there's, there's a God that loves them. And, and he wasn't, he's not going to let them go hungry anymore. Last year when we were on the ride to Clyde, we had the privilege of listening to Brenda Gray speak. And she's like the vice president of the Baptist Children's Home. And, and she told us, because over the years, we, we've heard so many stories about so many kids. And, and Brenda come before this group of, of bikers and she said I want you to picture yourself as a 10 year old boy and you're living in your dad's car with your dad and your two brothers in an alley and sometime during the night your dad tells you that he's going to go look for food so he leaves you there with your two younger brothers and y'all drift off to sleep. And you're awakened by the car door opening up and a flashlight shining in your face. And at 10 years old, you have an officer asking you, what are you doing in this alleyway? Where is your parents? 
And as the older brother, you instinctively get in front of your brothers to protect them. And before you know what's happening, the three of you are taken out of the car and you find yourselves at the children's home. Those are the kids we're feeding. And, and she told us about, picture yourself as a seven-year-old girl and your mom comes in the living room carrying your suitcase and telling you that she doesn't love you anymore and she doesn't want you anymore and she takes you outside and puts you on the porch and tells you to wait for your aunt to get you. That's somebody else we're feeding. And we've heard these stories and heard these stories and heard these stories. So I want to thank y'all for, for, for everything you brought and everything you're bringing because those are the kids we're feeding. And, and as long as God lets me and as long as Danny and, and the deacons, I hope to bring those kids in front of y'all because now you've heard those boys sing. You, you've seen their faces. I can tell you from now on that there's kids out there living in the woods, but now you've met them and you've seen their faces and you've heard them sing. So, so now, see, you've got a picture. You, you, not only am I bringing this food for somebody, I know who I'm, I've seen this child. So I hope to keep bringing them before y'all, that y'all can meet these kids and, 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 and love on them like God wants us to. Whenever I'm given the opportunity to speak before a group with the freedom to pick and choose the scripture, at some point I'll end up in Luke chapter 7 because I always come to Luke chapter 7 over and over again, beginning in verse 36. And it's not such a stretch that this lesson, that the woman that's in this lesson, that's here at this dinner, we can picture her in that hopeless and helpless situation that so many of these children find themselves in. So like I said, the, the scribes and Pharisees were upset that Jesus was eating with tax collectors, and, and we'll see in just a moment who he's about to eat with. In verse 36, we find, Luke chapter 7, verse 36, we find that Jesus has been invited to the home of, of a Pharisee to eat dinner. And we're given a front row seat by Dr. Luke to listen in. So, so we have this opportunity from, from Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to, to tell us what happened that evening. And, and it's wonderful that, that there's so much going on around this meal that you can't help but be drawn in. We see judgment, but not by Jesus. And we see worship, but not by the Pharisee. And, and there's grace, and there's repentance, and there's forgiveness all during the course of this one meal. So there's a lot going on in this home. It's no wonder that this meal would stand out. I mean, how many chances do you get to sit on a meal with God, a, a religious Pharisee, and a prostitute. I mean, that sounds almost like a, a joke you'd hear on, on the job site. But, but, but it really happened. So we're going to begin there. We're going to start with Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says this, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. I'm reading from the New King James, so if it don't exactly line up, I'm sorry. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, if you were to sit down and begin reading through the Gospel of Luke, and I'm sure uh, uh, this group probably has, and, and I know over the years you've heard Luke taught and Luke preach, so, so we've been through this Gospel. But if you sit down, by the time you reach chapter 7 of this Gospel, the last thing you would expect to see was Jesus being invited to eat with a Pharisee. In, in chapter 4, after Jesus claimed to be the fulfillment of prophecy, while reading from the book of Isaiah, y'all remember that. He, he was reading from Isaiah, and, and he claimed to be the fulfillment of the prophecy that he was reading. The men in the synagogue were so uh, angry, they were going to throw him off a cliff. And then you go over to chapter 5, he was accused by the scribes and Pharisees of speaking blasphemies. 
after forgiving a paralyzed man's sins and healing him. So we see from chapter to chapter how it's building. And then we're told in chapter 6 that these same leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, were filled with rage when Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. So you've got 4, 5, and 6 where these men are ready to kill Jesus. So by the time you open up in chapter 7, the last thing you expect to see is Jesus sitting at the table of a Pharisee having a meal. And you can bet this invitation to eat wasn't a gesture of friendship. Quite the opposite. If anything, it would be an opportunity to try to catch Jesus in something that he says over the course of the evening. So in verses 37 and 38, as it continues to flow, we're introduced to yet another unexpected guest. And here she comes. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil so what an opening you have I, I don't think guest is probably the right way to label her and in just a moment we'll see that this Pharisee whose name Simon by the way is disgusted by her so why is she there I mean, when, when, you, when you open this up and, and you see this dinner and and, and Luke just begins by shocking you because not only is Jesus sitting at the table having dinner in a Pharisee's home, but then behind Jesus you see this woman who the Bible says is a sinner and, and she's standing behind Jesus and she's weeping. So why is she there and how did she get in if Simon finds her so repulsive? And this is one of those times that we're reminded, and, and, and something we keep at the front of our minds as we're reading the Bible, that we think about the culture and what's acceptable behavior in that day. It was perfectly acceptable in Jewish society that if someone was having a dinner, if they were having a guest in, and they were having a, a, a group of people sitting around a table, it was perfectly acceptable for people to file into the home, to wrap around the room, and to listen to the conversation. They wouldn't eat and they wouldn't participate in the conversation. They would stand in the background and they would listen to it. It was a form of, of, of entertainment or something in that day. Like we said, there was, no, there was no internet, there was no TV, there was no cell phone. So it was perfectly acceptable for you to file in and listen to this dinner. They're just listening. So we have to believe that she came in with everyone else. I mean, there's example after example after example of wherever Jesus went. It's often said there was a multitude. So we can imagine when Jesus came in to sit with this Pharisee that the house was crowded, listening in to what was being said. In verse 37, the Bible clearly refers to her as a sinner. And, and that just leaps off the page because, because when you read something like that, it, at least... In my mind, when I'm reading that, I think to myself, well, isn't everybody sitting in the room with the exception of Jesus a sinner? I mean, why, why is Luke pointing her out? For Luke to point her out would have us wonder why she was the one that was being singled out. And then every commentary that I looked at said the same thing. In this verse, sinner isn't being used as a title or even a label, but it's an occupation. She, she was a prostitute. This same verse not only tells us who she was, but it also tells us why she was there. We read in the verse, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house. She came because she knew Jesus was there. Man, that, that, that's biblical truth that, that can rattle the walls of the churches. I mean, if we want conversion and we want lost 
sinners saved and inside the doors of the church it's, it's, it's not the preacher and it, it's not the teachers or the singing or the mission trips or the field trips or any of that you won't see people saved you take them to Jesus it, it's perfectly wonder to, wonderful to invite people to church but if I invite somebody to Jesus they're going to get in church So she came there because he was there. And she came prepared. I mean, that, that's something to, to see. She came in and she was ready. She brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. And, and to me, this is nothing short of amazing because we're not, we're not giving any details about where she came from or what she knew about Jesus. And we, we don't even know her name what we do know is that when God came into a religious leader's home, it was a prostitute that came prepared to worship him. So, so we see her standing there behind Jesus. And it, man, it's just, you, you sit at the kitchen table by yourself, you know, early morning and coffee and, and reading the word and, and you get that picture and you see her standing behind him and the verse tells us that she's weeping not not just not just crying not not just choked up but that she's weeping and i don't know if it's something she's heard jesus say or just his mere presence that has brought her to tears I do believe that she's under the conviction of her sins. Listen to the words of David from Psalm 51, a psalm of repentance after his sin with Bathsheba. He says this, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And, and, and we see this same emotion from Isaiah in the very throne room of God. What, what, did, what did Isaiah say? Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of, of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts and Jesus himself blessed are those for who mourn for they shall be comforted her conviction leads to repentance which leads to her worship it's all one step and stone to another to another it's in that spirit of worship that leads her to get down on the floor and wash Jesus feet with her, with her precious tears, wiping them with, with, with her hair. And then she begins to kiss his feet, anointing them with the fragrant oil. I mean, th this, this is going to happen again, only the next time it would take place in Bethany, six days before the crucifixion. And, and that, this time it would be Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha, who would not only anoint Jesus' feet, but also his head with fragrant oil. So it happens multiple times to, 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 heaven's going to be good I mean it's going to be good to, to, to be a part of that kind of worship that kind of praise Simon's not impressed with her display of worship what's he say look at verse 39 now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. There, there it is again. It's by his thoughts that we see that he knows what a profession is. And I'm for one am glad that Simon's thoughts an attitude or included in scripture 
because then I step back and I have to check mine. I have the I have the benefit of this. Man, man we we we've got something here. I know how this ends. I'm certain of who Jesus is. And and I recognize the tears of conviction because I've experienced it. <laughs> Just the other day, <laughs> you know. What if I was in Simon's place and it, it was my house? What would my thoughts and attitude be if a known prostitute came into my home like this? So often we read from the Bible and, and, and it, it's, it's just natural instinct when we're reading a book or when we're watching a movie, what do we try to do? We try to separate the good guys from the bad guys. When in reality, the only good guy in the room is Jesus. Everyone else, from the Pharisee to the prostitute, are in the same boat. And we have to recognize that there's two lost souls here with Jesus, and the only difference between the two of them is that only one of them realizes she's lost. Unfortunately, Simon has not only cast judgment about the woman, but he's made up his mind about Jesus as well. The, the events that are taking place right before his eyes are not reinforcing a faith in Jesus, but rather in his mind, it confirms what he thought all along. If he were a prophet, he would know what she is, and he wouldn't let her touch him. And then verse 40, Jesus, it begins with, and Jesus answered. And see, and that, that, that's, that's, that's awesome and terrifying. In verse 39, the Pharisee spoke to himself. And verse 40, Jesus answered, confirming even our thoughts aren't hidden. And even if I keep my behavior in check from day to day, even if I'm having a good day and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not what I call sinning, man, them thoughts come out of nowhere. I mean, they make me question myself some of the things. It's like, where did that come from? And immediately you're praying, God, please stop this because I can't. So we have that. That Jesus answered him on what he was thinking. So verse, verses 40 through 43, And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. So there was a certain creditor. He had two debtors, like we talked about just a moment ago. Jesus is dealing with two lost souls here. And he deals with Simon first by telling him this parable. In his telling of the parable, we see people who owe a debt they couldn't pay. One of the debtors owed about a month and a half of wages, while the other owed the equivalent almost two years' wages. And then Jesus tells Simon that the creditor freely forgave their debt. Both of them. Now, now, we read this parable or hear this parable, and what right away as, as believers, especially the Wednesday night crowd, we, we see the gospel in it. I mean, this, this, don't, this don't take us by surprise. We recognize the sin debt that is owed by each and every one of us, a debt we couldn't pay. We also see the one who paid that debt on the cross at Calvary. 
that God offers forgiveness of sins, what the Pharisee can't see, what he won't see, is that we all come up short. That sin isn't an act we commit, but it's at the very core of who we are. Throughout the Gospels, time and again, we see Jesus confront these men over their sins. So one, one of my favorite passages from the Bible, and it, it doesn't have a great ending, but, but it, it, it's, it's a great little part of the passage, is when, from Luke when Jesus is speaking with the rich young ruler. Because our Lord sets an example for us to follow and present the gospel. If you examine how Jesus is talking to this rich young ruler, he lays it out for it. I mean, we don't really need a program to learn how to share the gospel. We, we got this, and we got Jesus' example on how to do it. When the young man asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life, Jesus took him to the Ten Commandments to show him his sin. That's where he went. For us to try to talk to someone about the gospel without first showing them why they need it is like trying to give an antidote for a deadly disease to someone who doesn't know he's sick. He's not going to take it. So if I go to somebody and I'm trying to take the gospel to them and I'm, God loves you, Jesus died for you, but I don't tell them why they need it, they walk away. And, and man, we see it all the time. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 verse 7, For I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said, You shall not covet. To have an effective witness, show people why they need the gospel before you try to give it to them. As long as someone believes themselves to be good, that, that, that the murder on TV is a sinner, but I'm okay compared to him, he's not going to hear what you have to say. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, said, if you fail to use the law, you will fill the church with false converts. Somebody has to know why they need Jesus. That's where we start. Simon, who will love him more? I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Now take a look at verses 44 through 47. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he turned to the woman. I want you to notice that up to this point, no one's acknowledged this woman or what she was doing. Let's remember that Jesus spoke the parable in response to Simon's thoughts, not, not because of what she's doing. This is the first time anybody's even acknowledged her. Jesus' seemingly lack of response doesn't deter her worship of him. It's in this hostile environment toward not only her, but even more so toward Jesus that her worship stands out. So while Simon watched in disgust at the woman and what she was doing, Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, recognizes her worship and her love for him. We're, we're reminded of, of Saul's daughter, Michael, looking out her window at David dancing before the ark of God and being disgusted by his display of worship. More or less calling him a fool. 
Why should I be surprised when the pagan society I live in is hostile toward God and the people who love him? Jesus told us over 2,000 years ago how this was going to go. Also, let us take note that while Simon insulted this woman in his thoughts, that he openly and publicly insulted Jesus, he thought the insults toward the prostitute, he publicly insulted Jesus. Everything Simon did or failed to do when Jesus came into his home didn't go unnoticed. It was common courtesy in this culture to, to offer water to your guests for their feet, to welcome them into your home with, with, a, with a kiss, and to even anoint their head with oil. Simon's lack of manners it, it displays an open hostility toward Jesus and even suggests the ulterior motive that we were talking about. The woman, on the other hand, even with no acknowledgement from the Lord, extended these courtesies to Jesus in a very personal way despite the fact it wasn't even her home perhaps seeing the Lord being treated the way she was normally treated was more than she could bear what does all of this say about our personal worship that, that I can worship in any environment and that I should that trust that God sees and knows my worship is for him even if I feel no acknowledgement from him and not to be deterred from my worship as far as we know from our text this woman is the only one who is displaying any kind of form of worship among those gathered and we can't begin to imagine the level of intimidation she must have had experienced when she walked into the Pharisee's house. Yet here she is remembering in Scripture 2,000 years later for us to see her example. It's in verse 47 that Jesus ties the parable to what was happening in Simon's home. First of all, Jesus confirms what Simon was thinking about her. Yes, yeah, she's a woman with a whole lot of sin. What Simon doesn't know or anybody else gathered there was that her sins had been forgiven. They, they weren't forgiven because of this display of affection. They weren't forgiven because of her, her worship. This was the result of her forgiveness. When Jesus said, for she loved much, the word for used here is in the sense of wherefore. Her many sins are forgiven, wherefore she loves much. I mean, that connects to us, doesn't it? He forgave us. He loved us first. Simon, to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. He bore no fruit of repentance if he ever believed he sinned at all. He obviously felt he was superior to Jesus by the way he treated him. And he certainly showed no love towards him. The Pharisee believes it's the keeping of the law, that it's ceremonies and it's traditions that were taken to heaven. Paul wrote in the second chapter of Colossians, Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion false humility and neglect of the body and here it is but of no value against the indulgence of the flesh so none of that cleanses us of our sins do you remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector both men go up to temple to pray the Pharisee spends his prayer telling God how much better he was than, than other men I give this, I do that, I don't do this. The tax collector wouldn't so much as look up. He beat his chest in repentance and he asked God for mercy. Think about the position of these two people. Simon across from Jesus 
casting judgment on the prostitute, but on Jesus as well. The other being the woman in tears down on the floor at Jesus' feet. Not so much as looking up, not speaking, contrite and spirit broken over her sin. Man, the parable comes to life right before us. And we must avoid the trappings of our works to save us. Alistair Begg, he's a Scottish pastor, he gives a wonderful illustration in one of his sermons of an angel interrogating the thief on the cross and after asking the man about the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of scripture and receiving no answers from the thief on the cross, exasperated the angel asked the thief, how did you make it into heaven? And the fellow said, the man on the middle cross said I could come. That's the only answer. That's the only way. Jesus now turns to the woman in verse 48, and we're going to read through 50. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. As far as scripture tells us, this is the first time She's been spoken to since she entered the Pharisee's house. Your sins are forgiven. And apparently, everyone around the table was silent. But in their thoughts, everyone had the same question. Who is this who even forgives sins? Listen, we were told by Luke early on that she came to Simon's house because she knew Jesus was there. And with a broken, repentant heart, she came to worship. Did she recognize Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior, as the Son of God? We need to look no further than verse 50. Your faith has saved you. One book of the Bible builds on the next. You can take Paul's letters, John's, Peter's, and see them in the Gospels. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We have that picture right here. The woman is guilty of everything that the Pharisee thought about her. Jesus confirmed her many sins, but he showed her grace. He didn't overlook her sin. He would pray the price to redeem her. He would take the judgment of the Father on himself, crushed for our sins that we might have salvation. I appreciate y'all letting me speak tonight. Jack, you want to close us in prayer?